Good morning and welcome to Monmouth Weekly Praise as once again we join together across the ministry area to celebrate the presence of God within our communities. And today we have another special item uh, from Barbara. Uh, she'll be taking us to Gethsemane through some of the great paintings that the world has created. And also we have Bob from St. Mary's. He'll be sharing with us where St. Mary's is at uh, in the face of what we've been going through. And he'll also be singing for us. So we look forward to those items and we look forward to celebrating together in a home communion. If you have bread and wine, then you can join us at the end of this service. Thank you. Three, four. A little bit of love goes a long, long way. A little love, a little love, a little bit of love, and I'm on my way. A little love, a little love, a long way, but we'll get there together. A long way, but we'll get there soon. Along the way, we can lean on each other. A little love goes a long, long way. A little love, a little love, a little bit of love, and the sun comes shining. A little love, a little love, a little bit of kindness and someone smiling. A little love. A little love, a long way, but we'll get there together. A long way, but we'll get there soon. Along the way, we can lean on each other. A little love goes a long, long way. A little love, a little love. Little drops of rain can trickle down into a puddle, then the puddles get together, making streams and make a river. Rivers fill the valleys with a roaring and a rushing Then the little drops of rain have made a wide, 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 wide ocean A long way, but we'll get there together A long way, but we'll get there soon Along the way, we can lean on each other A little love goes a long, long way A long way, but we'll get there together a long way, but we'll get there soon. Along the way, we can lean on each other. A little love goes a long, long way. A little love, a little love, a little Well, welcome to St Mary's Church Trugare again. Um, over the last 12 months, it's been extremely difficult for all of us. We've not been allowed to sing, we've not been allowed to do anything much except stand two metres apart and not allowed to shake hands or anything that we would normally do in and around the church. Um, during the summer we had some services, um, socially distanced, maximum 15 people, all the rules and regulations which are necessary but not very exciting. We then got to December, normally on the last Thursday before Christmas we have our carol service. Proper nine lessons and carols, uh, the Bach choir come, our own choir is formed up for the occasion and we sing something like 12 or 14 uh, carols and arias and the proper nine lessons. None of it happened. We weren't allowed to come into church, we weren't allowed to play the organ or sing. Um, we all understand why, but very disappointing. We come to Christmas morning, I rang everybody that would normally attend the service. Nobody wanted to come. They were all afraid that the risk had got higher and so for the first time in at least a generation we had no Christmas morning Eucharist. That's a very sad occasion. But on we go. Um, ten days ago we had a morning prayer and Colin was unable to come to this event and so I led the service. 
Uh, but soon, next Sunday in fact, Colin will come up for Mothering Sunday and take our service and again for Easter when we'll have to just keep an eye on the numbers because we might get more people wanting to come. Um, meanwhile, uh, we look forward to the future. There will be a future. This church will continue, hopefully for the next century. Um, we will be able to sing again. My voice will improve again like it used to be a year or two ago when we sang every week. Uh, Let's look forward to that with hope. Hello everyone and it's lovely to join you again. Last week we were looking at paintings of the Last Supper and when they finish dining, Jesus and the disciples go out onto the Mount of Olives and eventually to the Garden of Gethsemane a peaceful place for prayer that they knew well. Judas has already left them, so Jesus takes 11 disciples. He takes Peter, James and John a little further into the garden and instructs them to wait and to pray for him while he goes ahead to pray to his heavenly father. And this is his prayer. Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, thy will be done. When he returns, he finds that the three disciples are not praying for him. They've fallen asleep. And this happens twice more. Judas leads the Roman soldiers to Jesus and betrays them with a kiss. Jesus is arrested. Soon afterwards, the disciples flee. And then Peter denies all knowledge of Jesus three times. Tonight, we're going to look at two representations of this event in the last days of Jesus' life. The first was painted in 1460 by an artist called Mantegna, who was born in Venice. If you want to see the painting, it's in the National Gallery in London. So we have the three sleeping disciples, Peter, always older, John in the centre, always very young, and James. Jesus is on a rock, praying with his back to us. And in the top left hand corner, we can see cherubs holding the symbols of the passion that is to come. There is a column to which Jesus will be tied and then whipped, a crucifix, a spear and a sponge with vinegar. On the right hand side at ground level, we see Judas leading in the soldiers and a mob from Jerusalem. Mantegna was always fascinated by classical architecture. We know he went on archaeological digs. And so we have a very unusual image of Jerusalem up in the top right of the painting. Immediately to the right of Jesus, we have a building that looks remarkably like the Colosseum in Rome. And then a very tall tower with a half moon on the top of it typical of Middle Eastern buildings. Then a much smaller tower, which resembles the Campanile in St. Mark's Square in Venice. This is the proud artist showing us his home city. And then a series of square buildings, typical of the architecture in the northern cities of Italy that he knew so well, like Milan and Ferrara. Mantegna was also very interested in nature. And you may see it in the right of the painting, high up in a tree, a dark bird, possibly a crow. And crows make their way very quickly to dead bodies and blood. So this is a symbol of the death of Jesus that is to come. And the bird is directly above Judas. It was his kiss that led to the events. You may notice behind the disciples a sapling that has pushed its way through the rock. And scholars think this could represent the tree from which Judas will hang himself when he realises the horror of what he has done. On the left of the painting, in the rock, you'll see a whole lot of little plants. 
I wish I could tell you the significance of these plants. They look rather like the weeds on my patio, so I'm afraid I don't have any special knowledge about those, but I expect there is some significance. What I can tell you is that you'll see a number of rabbits in this painting, and they are very significant. Rabbits always symbolise fertility and new life. So they're telling us that this is not the end of the story for Jesus. The death was not the end, but because of resurrection, Jesus would have a new life. The second painting was painted 30 years later by an Italian artist called Perugino. I think we've met him before. He'd probably seen the Mantegna painting, and certainly there are lots of resemblances. If you want to see this one, you will have to go to Florence to the Uffizi Gallery. In the foreground, we have our sleeping disciples, John, Peter and James. We have to remember that most of the disciples were teenage lads. They were so young. Look at John. On the left hand side, Judas is leading in the mob. They've come to watch the events unfold. It's a bit of a spectator sport to see a crucifixion. Perugino loved symmetry, and so he divides the group up into two. And on the right hand side, we have the Roman soldiers coming in. The landscape at the back of the painting is certainly not Italian. Perugino spent a lot of his life in Umbria, and in particular the city of Urbino, which was an international city. So perhaps the landscape is suggesting somewhere in France or Germany. There are far fewer details in this painting. No bird, no weeds, no rabbits. His focus is quite different. If we look closely at Jesus's face, he really wants us to see this face, as well as admiring the amazing skin tones that he's painted. For me, I see a very youthful face and a face full of sadness, but also calmness. Enjoy the colours in this painting, the pale pink of the angel's garment and the drapery of it flowing out behind. Judas's two-toned tunic, very unusual. And then the strong colours of Jesus and the disciples. So what can we learn from these paintings? We're living in a period of pandemic and a long period of lockdown. I think many of us, perhaps all of us, would say we're suffering in some way. Some have experienced horrendous physical suffering with COVID and even death. There's been a great deal of mental suffering. We all miss not be, being able to see our loved ones. There's been a lot of confusion and anxiety. We think of those in care homes for whom everything is so different. There's been acute loneliness. And we sometimes let down those we are closest to. Whatever we're going through, Jesus understands and he walks with us. He's been there. Mantegna stressed the physical pain of Calvary with those cherubs and the symbols. Perugino showed us the sadness of Jesus's face. It's interesting that Renaissance artists, when they painted this episode, didn't call it Gethsemane. Their title was Agony in the Garden. But I'd like to end on two positives. Firstly, when Jesus prayed, he said, thy will be done. And he endured such terrible agony because of his great love for each one of us. And secondly, those rabbits, they symbolise that this is not the end of the story and nor is Calvary, not for Jesus and certainly not for us if we trust him. So whatever else you think about next week and whatever happens to you, don't forget the rabbits. Have a very good week.
I was watching a program on Netflix a few days ago. A Muslim imam was leading his followers away from a traditional understanding of Islam toward a more inclusive version of the faith. The imam said, I have to tell you to throw away your assumptions about God. Stop clinging to what you think you know. Catholicism has historically held to the importance of both scripture and tradition, but I would argue that tradition has always had the upper hand. Martin Luther recognized this and nailed his challenge to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral with the hope of opening a dialogue that might lead to some kind of reform. Instead, he was cast out. The Reformation which followed had as one of its chief tenets Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, a lofty ideal, but totally unrealistic for our understanding of Scripture is almost always perceived through the eyes of the traditions which have nurtured us. Anglicanism added to the Scripture and tradition the third leg of reason. However, the idea that reason can be divorced from tradition into which we have been birthed is also a philosophical ideal that rarely comes to pass. Just sit and watch three men around a campfire reasoning with one another about religion or politics, and you would not be surprised if it turned eventually into a heated argument or even a fight. We are schooled into these traditions by parents, siblings, teachers and priests, and these traditions form the basis of all of our assumptions about God, man, and the universe. We may not hold a theory of everything, but we do hold immovable assumptions about many things. And those assumptions sometimes prevent us from seeing things in a new way, sometimes prevent us from seeing God as God really is. I have to tell you, said that imam, to throw away your assumptions about God, stop clinging to what you think you know. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Oh, 
that were a present far too small. Thus, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my Listen to the Gospel of Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning and welcome as we share together in a home communion. We pray that God's presence will be very real to you as we share in the bread and in the wine. And if you do not have bread and wine handy at the moment, please stop the video, go and get some, and we will celebrate Holy Communion together. We celebrate together the gifts and grace of God. We take this bread, we take this wine, to follow Christ's example and obey his command. Let us pause for a moment as we examine our hearts in the presence of God. And we ask for God's forgiveness for anything that we have failed to do that we ought to have done, and for anything that we have done that we ought not to have done. For we are called to follow in the way of Jesus. God forgives you. Be at peace. Hear us, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, and through him accept our sacrifice of praise, and grant that by the power of your Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be for us the body and blood of Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins, Whenever you do this, remember me. Let us together proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Lord God, send your Holy Spirit upon all of us who share in this bread and this cup this day. Strengthen our faith, make us one, and welcome us and all your people into the glorious kingdom of your Son, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. 
and we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. For though we are many, we are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. May the body and blood of Christ keep you in everlasting life. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and forever. Amen. <laughs>